Good morning, church. It is good to see everyone this morning. Uh, If you have your Bibles, we are looking at Matthew chapter 2 today, verses 1 through 12, one of the most familiar Christmas passages uh, in Christianity. I still thought it would be uh, fun to review it today, to look at it again, hopefully look at it with fresh eyes by the grace of God and see what it might have uh, for us today. Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 through 12. The passage says this. Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, Behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? For we saw a star when it rose, and have come to worship him. When Herod the king heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. They told him, In Bethlehem of Judea. For so it is written by the prophet, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Then Herod summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring word to me, Uh, that I too may come and worship him. After listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. And going into the house, they saw the child with Mary, his mother, and they fell down and worshipped him. Then, opening their treasures, they offered him gifts, gold and frankincense, and myrrh. And being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. Uh, Let's pray one more time. Our gracious Heavenly Father, um, Lord, beyond all the Christmas celebrations this year and um, all the holiday traditions, I pray that Um, in the forefront of our minds and our hearts would be Emmanuel, God with us. And Lord, as we uh, finish off this crazy year of 2020, we do just thank you for that great promise that you are with us uh, and that you live in us by your Holy Spirit. And we thank you, Lord, that even though this world may seem dark at times, Uh, that we have the true light, uh, who is Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And I just pray, Lord, that as we dig into your word today, uh, I just pray that you would reveal yourself to us in a new and a fresh way, that you would deepen our faith, and that you would just stir in us a greater excitement for Jesus Christ, our great hope. Uh, Lord, I just pray that you would guide me uh, just through this text and help me to keep my thoughts straight and not preach anything that would be misleading or inaccurate. And uh, just pray that you would bless this time together. We love you so much, and it's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Verses 1 and 2 uh, starts out, it says, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who has been born king of the Jews? These wise men are some of the most well-known figures in Christianity today uh, because of the Christmas tradition. You might know that very popular Christmas song, We Three Kings. We three kings from Orient are bearing gifts we traverse afar. I would sing more. I don't want to torture you, though. But in spite of what we know about these uh, wise men, our tradition 
puts in a lot of detail that actually isn't in the text. For example, uh, we don't know if there's three kings or if there's more. The reason why three has been assumed throughout history is because there's three different gifts given, gold, frankincense, and myrrh, but there's no indication that there's only three of these uh, magi or these kings. There may have been uh, well more than three, and that was probably likely the case given that all Jerusalem was troubled uh, by these people. Furthermore, there's no indication that these wise men are kings. Not sure where that came from exactly, uh, but there's no indication that they're kings. They, uh, they're called magi, which comes from the Greek word magos or magus, and it's where we get our English word magic or magician. Uh, a magi in the ancient world was just an expert in interpretation. Uh, they would have been experts in astrology. They would have been experts in occultic practices and interpretation. They would have been among some of the most educated, literate people in the ancient world. Uh, it says that these magi came from the east, and most scholars think that they would have come from ancient Persia or Babylon. And if that was the case, if they came from Babylon, it means that this little Christmas journey would have been actually about 800 miles that they would have traveled if that's where they were coming from. And so it's no small journey that these magi would have been on to get to Jesus. It might be worth noting that Daniel, uh, Daniel the prophet, was the chief of the magi. We read that in Daniel chapter 5, verse 11, that Daniel himself was considered a magi. And as a magi, we read in Daniel chapter 1, that he would have been educated in the language and the literature of the Chaldeans for three years before he would go on to serve as an advisor to the king of Babylon. So that kind of gives you an idea of who these magi are and where they might come from. Uh, why does Matthew include the magi in his gospel? It may be because these magi recognized Jesus as the king of the Jews. Uh, again, they were some of the smartest, most educated people of the ancient world, and Matthew is trying to uh, make the claim that Jesus is the king who has been prophesied all throughout the Old Testament. And these magi would add credibility to his claim that Jesus is who he is. These magi might also hint to us God's love not only for the Jews, but the entire world. Uh, they would have been these pagan Gentiles. They were non-Jewish, and yet they're here at the birth narrative of Jesus. It reminds us of John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only son. And when we read these birth narratives of Jesus in the Gospel of Matthew and the Gospel of Luke, it's interesting to note that some of the first people impacted by Jesus were these pagan Gentiles who probably would have been despised by the Jews and shepherds who would have been the most uneducated, filthy outcasts in the Jewish society. Now, going on, uh, the question about this star, what is this star exactly that they were following and why were they following it. It says, we have seen his star when it rose and have come to worship him. You know, actually just the other night, I found this really interesting. Uh, I was outside with my bare feet for just a little bit because I was looking in the sky and I was freezing my tail off, but I saw this picture of this, what's known as this great conjunction. And the climax of this great conjunction will be, I think, tomorrow night. Uh, Jupiter and Saturn are going to be in alignment within like 0.1 degree difference. Together, in the early evening, they will be the brightest that they have been in over 800 years. Um, supposedly, this conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn would have also taken place in the year 7 BC. 
And some scholars think that this could have been the star that these magi were following. Another theory is that it was a conjunction of Venus and Saturn in the year 3 BC. Whatever it is, the Bible simply doesn't say. There's just a lot of theories on what these magi were following. I personally think it was just a supernatural event, a supernatural light given by God himself to lead these magi to Jesus. Whatever the case, we don't know. And the same question as why were these magi following the star in the first place is one of speculation. But the one that I find the most convincing, or the most convincing answer, is that these magi would have been familiar with the prophecy of Balaam given in Numbers chapter 24, verse 17. Again, these magi would have been considered some of the most literate, uh, well-versed people in the ancient world, and they probably would have known the Old Testament scriptures along with a, a lot of other ancient religions. Numbers 24, 17, you don't need to turn there, but it is a messianic prophecy. And just listen to what Balaam of Peor says in this passage. The oracle of him who hears the words of God and knows the knowledge of the Most High who sees the vision of the Almighty falling down with his eyes uncovered, I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, and a scepter shall rise out of Israel. And so this may have been the basis for these magi or what led them to follow the star in the first place. We don't know for sure, but one thing that is worth noting is that the star didn't lead these magi all the way to Jesus. It got them close to Jesus. They found themselves in Jerusalem, but they were still six miles away from Jesus. They had to learn the scriptures to find out where Jesus was. They weren't able to find Christ until they heard the prophecy of Micah 5.2 that this ruler would have come out of Bethlehem. It's just striking to note that some of the most intellectual, uh, wise people of the ancient world still could not figure out where Jesus was by their own rationality. You know, it's true all throughout history that mankind, uh, by our greatest efforts and all our greatest wisdom and our scientific advances, still cannot comprehend God. He transcends our thinking, and the only way we can comprehend God is if he reveals himself to us. But this is exactly what he has done. God has revealed to him revealed himself to us by his living word, Jesus Christ, and by his written word, which we have in front of us today. There's a pastor by the name of Alistair Begg who said it like this, God has given us his written word to introduce us to his living word. We can't get to know God except through the Christ of God, who is delivered to us by the word of God. Moving on in this text, it says in verse 3 that when Herod the king heard this, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him, and assembling all the chief priests and the scribes of the people, he inquired of them where the Christ was to be born. And so they told him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for so it is written by the prophet, and here they quote, uh, the Old Testament book of Micah, chapter 5, verse 2, which says, And you, O Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For from you shall come a ruler who will shepherd my people Israel. Once again, in Matthew's effort to uh, claim that Jesus is the Messiah anticipated in the Old Testament, 
is given further credibility by the fact that Jesus was born in Bethlehem, which the Old Testament predicted. But there's something else that sticks out to me about these verses. And it is the fact that these chief priests and the scribes of the people, the leaders of the Jewish religion, knew where the Christ was to be born. They were only six miles away compared to these magi who probably came from 800 miles away. And yet they had no interest in Christ. It's like they were close to him, but they didn't know him. They knew their Bible up and down, but they didn't know the Christ of faith. You know, there's a lot of people today who may be close to Christ in the sense that they're in church circles, they know their Bible up and down, they can give you any kind of answer you want when it comes to religion, they have uh, religious family members, they've heard the gospel again and again and again, They're close to Jesus, and yet they don't know Jesus. Why is it? Because they've never received Jesus in faith. They've never actually trusted in Jesus as Lord. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever reads their Bible and does their Christian duties will have him. No, 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 no. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life, according to John chapter 3, verse 16. You know, it's also just striking in here to think about the differences uh, in these different groups of people. It might be worth noting that you have Herod, who's absolutely opposed to Jesus. You have these... Uh, Jewish leaders who are ignorant of Jesus, and you have these magi who are ready to worship Jesus. When you think about everyone today and how they respond to Jesus, it's one of those three ways. People are either going to be opposed to Jesus, they're going to ignore Jesus, or they're going to humbly worship him. This is how it always goes again and again and again. In verse 7, it says, Herod summoned the wise men, and he secretly... Oh, he summoned the wise men secretly and ascertained from them what time the star had appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem, saying, Go and search diligently for the child. And when you have found him, bring me word that I too may come and worship him. The reason why he probably secretly sent these magi is because he didn't want to have a rebellion or some kind of uprising in Jerusalem. And when he says that he wanted to come worship Jesus... We know that this is just a bunch of baloney. Uh, You can read in chapter 2, verse 16, that he actually wanted to kill Jesus. This is why he had all the infants in the Bethlehem area, two years old and under, slaughtered. The picture that we get of Herod here in this passage is right in line with what we know of this Herod the Great historically. Herod the Great would have ruled in Judah and Israel beginning in the year 37 BC. He was appointed by the Romans to rule the area, and he definitely had the interests of Rome at the forefront of his, uh, his rulership. In the early years of Herod's life, he may have actually been considered a good leader from some different respects. Uh, He was incredibly successful at keeping the peace. Uh, He made Rome a ton of money through heavy taxation of the Jews. He was a prolific builder. We know this about him in history. Herod the Great, uh, he expanded the Jewish temple. He built four or five different fortresses. He built the city of Caesarea, and he rebuilt the city of Samaria, He saved the Olympic Games at one point. Uh, All sorts of different architectural um, achievements. However, towards the end of his life, this Herod the Great, uh, he got some kind of mental illness and he went somewhat insane. He was married to nine or ten different wives and he had 14 different children. Uh, Busy guy. One of his wives, Mary he had 
killed or executed because he suspected her of treason. He also had his two first sons killed for the same reason and his mother-in-law. He was terribly afraid of losing his throne, and so he basically killed off anybody who posed a threat to him. It's even said that he killed 300 of the Jewish leaders at one point in his life. And it's interesting, he was so worried that people would celebrate his death that he planned to have all the Jewish leaders killed the moment he died so that there would only be tears shed upon his death, of which he died in 4 BC. You know, when you think about Herod and his reign, it provides an interesting contrast to the reign of Christ. King Herod, who is this illegitimate king, he's from the line of Esau, he's an Edomite. He shouldn't have been on the throne in the first place. He's uh, wildly corrupt, and he's willing to kill people to save his own power and his own honor and his own integrity. And it leads us to Jesus, this true and righteous king who's appointed by God himself, who lays down his own life for his people to save the world. It's like, if you want to know what Jesus is like, if you want to understand the gospel, look at King Herod and everything he did, and then consider the opposite to be true of Jesus. You know, it's like if somebody were to come up here with a sweater on, you'd realize just how much more beautiful my sweater is, right? It's like you see an ugly sweater, and the ugly sweater brings out the brilliance of the beautiful sweater. And this is what Herod does for Jesus, who comes after him. Now, that wasn't a joke. What's going on here, Dom? Just kidding. I'm kidding. Uh... So, in verse 9, after listening to the king, they went on their way, and behold, the star that they had seen when it rose went before them until it came to rest over the place where the child was. And when they saw the star, they rejoiced exceedingly with great joy. Hence the song, O Holy Night, and those wonderful lyrics, A Weary World Rejoices saying most beautifully by the love of Maddie's life, Josh Groban, unfortunately, not me. Will be me sometime. I'm kidding. I'm just jealous of him. These magi, in verse 11, they go into the house, they see the child with Mary, his mother, and they fall down and they worship him. Notice that these magi worship him, not them. Mary and Joseph are not worshipped. There's no indication in Scripture that Mary is worshipped. There's no indication in Scripture that she had a perpetual virginity and that she was on the same level as Christ. He alone is worshipped in this passage. And then opening up their treasures, they offer Jesus gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Matthew doesn't say what the symbolism is in this passage, or if there even is symbolism, but based on how often we see these three different types of gifts, it's hard not to assume that they were symbolic of something. For example, gold. Uh, we see it all throughout the Old Testament, and it typically signifies royalty. Crowns are made of gold. The inner rooms of the temple, uh, everything in them was overlaid with gold. Why? Because it was signifying royalty. Frankincense seems to signify deity. Uh, it was used in the grain offerings throughout the Old Testament. Uh, when people wanted to offer a pleasing aroma to the Lord, they would make an offering that included frankincense. We see that in Leviticus chapter 2. And myrrh was a perfume that was very common in the ancient world. Brides would often use myrrh to smell better for their wedding day. Beds were covered with myrrh, and myrrh was also used as a burial spice. You might recall Joseph and Nicodemus in John chapter 19, verse 38 and 39. They come to grab the dead body of Jesus to put him in a tomb, and they wrap him in linen cloths, 
using 75 pounds of myrrh mixed with aloes. And so the fact that these magi offer Jesus gold, frankincense, and myrrh may indicate, or may at least give us a glimpse at who Jesus truly is, that he is a king, that he is divine, and that he would eventually die. Maybe, maybe not. At the end of the day, though, these magi were basically willing to give up their life, travel all this way, and empty out their bags for Jesus Christ. But we know that they left there with their hearts full. It reminds me of the verse in Matthew 10, uh, 39, where Jesus says, whoever would find his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Then we have in this story here, Herod, who does everything he can to keep his life. He's power hungry. And he loses it. He comes to a tragic and sad ending. But we have these magi here who give up their life. And by every indication, they find it because they left with treasure in their hearts. It reminds me of another verse in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. And I was just thinking about this as we approach the Christmas holiday. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. We'll just end here on this verse. Jesus says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Again, when you think about Herod, he tried to keep what he had, and he lost it. And it's the story of so many people today holding on for their dear life to every possession they have, thinking that somehow these material goods can give us life. Right? That it can fill the void in our heart. And if 2020 has been, uh, if we've learned anything from this year, it's that everything in this life can be taken away in a moment's notice. Whether it be our job, whether it be our health, whether it be our friends and our families or our hobbies, or anything that we put our life into in hopes that we can get life in return. These magi uh, are good reminders to us today. They give up everything. They empty the greatest treasures they have and lay them at the feet of Jesus. And we think about the value of gold. And they were willing just to lay it down at the feet of Christ. Why is that? Because their treasure was in something so much greater than what gold could ever bring us. It was in Christ himself. Christ who can never be taken away from us. Christ who is our hope for all eternity. Our rock in an otherwise crazy and chaotic world. The question for us that I would just invite us to consider as we approach this Christmas holiday would just simply be this. What is our treasure in? What do we consider to be our greatest treasure in life? And I would just offer a friendly word that if it's not Christ, where do you think it's going to get you? Where do you think it's gotten everybody else? Let me uh, close us with a word of prayer. As we do, the worship team I would invite them to come back up, and we will close out our time with one last song. Our gracious Heavenly Father, I just pray, Lord, that you would be our treasure, and uh, that we wouldn't put our hope in the things that can only fail us sooner or later. And uh, Lord, we just thank you for the great salvation we have in Christ the great promise of Emmanuel, 
And uh, we just thank you that you are with us. We thank you, Lord, that um, you will never leave us nor forsake us. And uh, Lord, in a dark world, we thank you that we can be like these magi and rejoice with exceeding joy, knowing who you are and knowing uh, that you died for our sins, that you were buried, and that you were raised to life on the third day, and that our hope is anchored in you. We love you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. There's debate on that. Either way, uh, he could have had her become a complete social